and welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming on our virtual walk around the blue plaques of Worcester. My name is Miriam and I'm one of the Green Badge Guides of Worcester and we've been doing walks and talks for over 20 years. Now over the last 10 years the Civic Society have promoted and put in place blue plaques for over 30 um, memorable citizens, um, all kinds of citizens and it tells of their lives and their achievements and they've asked us to do these walks and so uh, this is why it's all happening. I shall pass you on to several other guides, each would um, talk about the, one of the plaques and uh, uh, where you can find the plaques. We're going to start with the Elgar plaque here. Now Elgar, as we all know, is our most famous citizen and he lived here in this premises which was the music shop for many many years. The family opened a music shop in 1863 and they were the Elgar brothers and that was Henry and his brother William. Now William was a very talented musician, he was the organist at the Catholic Church, he tuned pianos and he sold and repaired musical instruments. So they had a really thriving business here. And in 1963 the whole family moved in and lived above the shop. You can see here um, a, a vision of, of the shop. It isn't here anymore because they had to widen the road some years ago. But the whole family moved in, mother and father and seven children. Edward Elgar was the middle child. Now soon after they moved in, sadly the oldest brother and the youngest brother both died. So that left just the five. But they were all very musical and loved living in the city centre. One of the favourite things that uh, Edward used to do would be go into the cathedral and listen to the music playing. The rehearsals for the Three Christ Festival really inspired him and uh, was, was the beginning of his love of music, I think. He used to go with his father down to the Catholic Church too, where he was, his father was the organist, as I said, and um, Edward used to go down and, start, and uh, turn the pages for him as he p played the, the organ. And this is when Edward started writing his music. He wrote lots of little uh, tunes that he named after the villages in, in Worcestershire. One of the other things he loved doing too, he would go with the doctor or with the baker around going into the villages. Anything but go to school, he didn't like going to school. Now, this is number 10 on the high street. At number six, three doors down, was his best friend, Hubert Lester. Hubert Lester was a very well-known historian and um, writer. And he was a lifelong friend of Edward's, and they were both Roman Catholic. And so they used to run down to the water gate at the cathedral, get on the ferry, go across the river, and walk out to Littleton House, which was the school near Bennett's Dairy, what is now Bennett's Dairy. And uh, so eventually he became head boy of the school, although he didn't like school much. One of his great joys when he was a boy was to go with his father and his uncle and his brothers down to the Glee Club. Now the Glee Club was in um, the Crown Hotel in Broad Street. Do go and have a look in there because uh, there's a room upstairs called the Elgar Room which is devoted to the Glee Club and to uh, the history of that Glee Club. Sadly it all finished the beginning of the First Second World War. Uh, now he uh, lived here right up until he was 15 and left school. His father made him get a proper job. He told him he'd never make a, a living at may have writing music. But of course, we all know that it was wrong. Anyway, Edward had to get a job as uh, um, secretary in the solicitor's office, William Allen, right next to the Roman Catholic Church. So, so he went and lived with his sister during that time because his sister lived in Sansom Walk near the Catholic Church. After that he moved to Morven where he taught in the girls schools. Now I'm going to leave you there because uh, that was the whole time that he lived here during his childhood. If you want to know more 
I'll give you a lovely walk around the city, an Elgar walk or an Elgar talk. Just look at our website and uh, I will give you all the information. I'll now pass you on to Robert, who's going to tell you about one of the other characters in Worcester. Thank you. Well, hello and welcome. My name's Robert and I'm a Green Badge Guide of Worcester Walks. I'm stood outside Diglis House which today is a lovely Georgian riverside hotel here off 7th Street. But the blue plaque here informs us that it was the birthplace of Benjamin Williams leader in 1831. He was a landscape artist. His father was chief engineer of the Seven Navigation Commission. Benjamin altered his name to Benjamin Williams leader simply because there were so many artists who had the surname of Williams. He was born and brought up here in Worcester. He attended the local Worcester Grammar School, but his career took a different path. He wasn't going to be an engineer, but an artist. And he attended the School of Design in Pierpoint Street. And he went on from there to the Royal Academy. He was a very accomplished artist. Landscape was his thing. And he was very fond of Worcestershire. In fact, after he'd been living in London for a while, when he was training at the Royal Academy, he bought a house in Whittington. His subject matter was very much that which is familiar to folk in Worcestershire. The lanes, the fields, the churches, and of course the river. He not only painted in this area, but also into Wales. One of his most famous paintings is called February Phil Dyke, and can, can be seen in the Birmingham Art Gallery. But his paintings can be seen throughout the country in galleries and, of course, here in Worcester. He exhibited on over 140 occasions at the Royal Academy. And he was also a director of the Royal Porcelain Works. And in recognition of his achievements, he was awarded Freeman of the City in 1898. And now I will hand over to Sandy. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name's Sandy Kale and I'm a founder member of Worcester Walks. I'm a Green Badge Guide, uh, 20 years a member, born and bred in Worcester. And uh, not only do I do guided tours, but I do presentations, PowerPoint presentations as well. And if you want to book any of those, just go on the website www.worcesterwalks.co.uk and all the information is on there. As you can see, we're standing by the King, what's known now as King Charles House uh, in New Street, formerly known as Glover Street, and this plaque tells us that this is where the Great Escape happened, uh, well at least took off from. And now this is the greatest escape story ever written. And it's a big story, and I do an hour for this normally, so I'm condensing this into five minutes. So this is going to be the abridged version. If you want to see more, come to my presentation. But basically, Charles, young Charles had uh, walked marched in fact from Scotland uh, and gathered together 15,000 royal, loyal, royalist supporters 
uh, and arrived in Worcester in <laughs> August 1651. This is the end of the Civil War. It actually started in 1642 in Worcester with the first clash of arms. And by now we've gone nine years. Cromwell has been uh, uh, ruling uh, as the Commonwealth for nine years. Charles is only 21 years old and he's settled here, lodged here with Captain Barclay. Uh, he's made his headquarters in the commandery. Uh, and as I say, he's got 15,000 uh, rough Scots and English. We've got 7,000 citizens. And unfortunately, Cromwell's army is arriving and surrounding our city with 30,000 crack troops. Now this is the model army. This is the greatest standing army in Europe at the time. The roundheads, we call them. And they're firing on our city. Charles has fortified our city. We have walls 50 feet tall and five feet thick and he's gone into the county and fortified bridges like Bewdley, Bransford, Upton upon Severn and Evesham. But one by one these places are falling and he's overwhelmed by two to one and he's at the commandery outside of Sidbury Gate. He can see there are a thousand dead. Uh, the streets, it's said, the streets are running red with blood. So he runs across the rooftops, across the town ditch, which is where the canal is nowadays, and they say he runs across these rooftops and starts in Friar Street and runs along Friar Street. Now soldiers are trying to capture him because Oliver Cromwell has put a quarter of a million pounds in today's money on his head. Tremendous amount to capture him alive. But they don't capture him and people are trying to save him. And He gets to this building here and he goes uh, inside and they say, look, we've got a horse waiting for you at St. Martin's Gate. And so he goes, there's fighting in this building after he's uh, escaped. Some say if you go on the ghost walk, they, they'll tell you that this, this building here is still haunted today. But he escapes, and this is where the greatest escape story ever told actually starts. And it, it takes six weeks and over 630 miles. And he goes north to start with, and you can see on this plaque here, that there's an oak tree with a crown in the middle of it. This is the royal oak, as we call it, because yes, he did have to hide in the oak tree in Boscobel House, which is in Staffordshire. And many families and many people risked their lives and he, to, just to get him out of the country. And as I say, six weeks long. He's, tw he's six feet, two inches tall. He's only 21, he's got beautiful skin, lovely long hair. He doesn't look like anybody else. He doesn't sound like anybody else. It's a, it's a great deal of difficulty to smuggle him out of this country. But eventually, he does get away. And I, all, I, I tell you, it all started here in Worcester. So I'd like to hand you over now to Roberta. Oh hi, it's Roberta here, a Blue Badge Guide and uh, a member of Worcester Walks. And uh, this evening I'd like to introduce you to Dr John Wall. Now, uh, people from outside Worcester uh, probably haven't heard of Dr John Wall, but uh, he's one of those people who, um, what can I say, um, could do actually or did actually everything. You know, one of those people that you might have been at school with who was good at science, good at art, one of those types. Well, born in 1708, he was born just outside Worcester in Powick. And uh, he was very, very bright indeed, in particular in sciences. And he won a scholarship to go to Worcester College uh, in Oxford. He studied algebra and mathematics and the classics and then went on to Merton College to study medicine. He came back uh, to Worcester and he married a lady called Catherine in 1740 
and they had this house built here which was called his out of town house out of town because it was built outside the city walls here in Fourgate Street. Now you will be able to see the plaque uh, above me here, 43 Fourgate Street, in this house where John Wall brought up his family. He had five sons, two of them became uh, very famous uh, physicians and went to London. Now, as I said, he's one of these people that was good at absolutely everything. And when he was here in Worcester uh, in the 1740s, there was lots of diseases. Well, of course, that's topical at the moment. And there was a smallpox outbreak. And uh, he was a very modest and a very caring man. And uh, he thought, well, We've, we, you know, I'd like to uh, build a hospital for the poor uh, people of Worcester and he managed to get the Bishop of Worcester as he was then, uh, the Bishop Isaac Maddox and uh, got a few other people together and they founded, would you believe, Worcester Infirmary. So in 1746, Worcester's first infirmary opened and guess what? There was to be no people admitted that were dying. Can you believe that? I mean, after all, it was a hospital. No pregnant women and nobody that was going to cause trouble. So I guess that was most of the population at the time. However, as time went on, it became um, very much crowded and they needed to build another infirmary. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that a little bit later on. Now, would you believe Dr. John Wall, he studied the evaporation of water, would you believe, not very far away in Malvern. And the saying goes that he founded that Malvern water contained absolutely nothing at all. So again, caring for sick people and uh, founding the first village spa in Malvern Wells. Now, I told you he was very interested in science and um, he, one of his friends was a guy called William Davis and uh, he was one of his colleagues uh, in um, Malvern and also uh, in Worcester and he got very interested in the study, would you believe, of materials to make porcelain. Now, would you believe he also was a very good artist and actually on this site at the old Green Dragon Inn, which was behind this building, he would actually make, um, we would be at his easel and he would be found many a day uh, painting in oils. And he was so good that he exhibited at the Royal Academy many, many times. So good, in fact, that his contemporary David Garrick would actually visit him here at the back here and it was known that he would jump up and down on his chairs just to look at his paintings. Now I'm going to hand you over to my colleague Chris Gates, uh, also a Blue Badge Guide and uh, he's going to tell you about Sir Charles Hastings who founded the British Medical Association uh, at the new infirmary as it was then in Castle Street. So over to you Chris. Good afternoon and this is now the second blue plaque on this house in Fourgate Street uh, which is actually the house of another very very famous physician and doctor of national recognition. John Wall was local recognition and a regional but Sir Charles Hastings had national recognition as well as a huge medical practice here. Uh, he's best well known nationally for founding the British Medical Association actually at the boardroom in the infirmary uh, in 1832. To give you some idea of his background, he was the ninth of 15 children uh, of the father was rector of Martley, a small village uh, 
to, to the west of here. Uh, rector of Martley and his long-suffering wife, as you can imagine, with 15 children. Now, it's quite apt that we're talking about uh, pandemics now in this particular time because Charles Hastings was also very prominent in dealing with national and local outbreaks of cholera and uh, typhus in the in the town itself. Uh, quite a precocious lad um, of say a gifted family one of the brothers made it to the rank of admiral in the navy but he was educated at the Royal Grammar School which is a couple of hundred yards uh, to, to my left and he had a great interest in natural history and particularly in uh, medicine as well as natural history and didn't particularly want to go into uh, the church as his father and became apprentice to two apothecaries in Sourport. Yeah. He rose up through the ranks there, was well thought of, and went to a very famous school of anatomy in London. And at the age of 16, he was offered a house surgeon appointment at Worcester Royal Infirmary. Almost unheard of at that stage. He was so precocious and so gifted. And there was a lot of controversy over his appointment that literally uh, he got it over some members of the Royal College of Surgeons, so very, very particular. Uh, from there, he went up to study medicine. Unusual to think of a house surgeon not being qualified, but he went to Edinburgh to study medicine uh, at the age of uh, 18 and didn't like the Scottish climate. Uh, a lot of the family had respiratory problems. In fact, four, five of the uh, his siblings died in childhood of respiratory disease, catarrh and inflammation, and another four of his elder uh, um, siblings died later in life. Uh, so he didn't like the Scottish climate, came back, recovered, went back to, to Edinburgh and qualified there in 18, um, uh, 1818. They offered him a professorship, a junior professorship there, but he wanted to come back to Worcester and serve the population here. And say he was so devoted to the population, also the diseases caused by uh, filthy water, bad occupational health, in the gloving industry, in the China factory, he wanted to get to the root causes of the diseases, not just to treat them, but to get back to basic level. And he was so well thought of, his practice was so wide, in particular, he specialized in respiratory diseases, as uh, must have been uh, from his own family. Huge practice, became very wealthy and was able to buy this particular very fine building on Fourgate Street. Uh, there's a history of doctors here uh, from John Wall to the middle Dr. Soames and then um, uh, Charles Hastings married Soames' daughter and inherited this house. He gave a lot of his money away to looking after the poor of Worcester. He felt that cramped conditions, slum conditions were uh, inherent in disease, lack of ventilation, and pressed for clean water to the, the town and to the villages. He actually f was so well thought of in the, West, in the Midlands that a group of 50 doctors got together and formed the Provincial Medical and Surgical Association in 1832. As I've mentioned before, that was in the boardroom of the infirmary and that was the uh, precursor to the British Medical Association uh, which was formed when the Medical Act happened in the 1850s. The Medical Act was to make certain that the standard of medical education was uniform. Uh, he carried on his work and was a founder member of the Council of the British Medical Association and also um, putting a lot of money into Worcester. It's quite a noisy, noisy place here. 
Now, he was born and wealthy enough at a time to be totally interested in natural history. Uh, as a lot of wealthy gentlemen were, um, who didn't have to work for a living, Hastings had to work for a living, a lot of people were interested in natural history, and he collected a lot of geological samples, birds, uh, flowers, etc. And he started off the Natural History Museum in Worcester, which is on the site of the Odeon, which is about 100 yards to my right. And that was quite an affluent society. Uh, it had a rather porticoed lecture hall. Hang on, we're going to be taken over by cyclists now. Uh, a lecture hall that seated 500 people. Uh, and then he gave his collection to, to that museum or to that society, which was then rehoused in the art gallery and museum that you can just see opposite the building there. So an incredible man. Um, in his medical practice, he used microscopes to look at um, uh, uh, microorganisms in sputum, in the lungs. He was one of the first people in the Midlands to use stethoscope that had only been um, used for the first time four years before he practiced and was incredibly well thought of. The legacy that he's left, not only the British Medical Association, his own private collection, but he's recognised as such a national leader that he has a window in the cathedral, the Hastings Museum, that was funded by the British Medical Association. His funeral was huge and attended by many, many thousands of people because he actually physically attended every person when he was around that had cholera or typhoid or typhus, much to risk to his own health. The medical centre at the new Royal Infirmary is also named after him, the Charles Hastings Postgraduate Medical Centre. A wonderful man, national local hero who's still remembered today and such a wonderful building as well. Thank you. I'm Chris Gates and I'm a member of Worcester Walks and a Blue Badge Tourist Guide. Thanks. Hello, my name's Marguerite and I'm a guide with Worcester Walks and I'm going to tell you something more about the blue plaque that's here behind me at uh, number 25 Friar Street and it's dedicated to Hannah Snell. I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, and she is Britain's famous female soldier. Hannah was born here on the 23rd of April, 1723. Um, the house was occupied by her father, who was a hosier and dyer, uh, in common with a lot of people in this street. He was involved in the clothing trade. And his name was uh, Samuel, Samuel Snell, and he and his wife had eight children. Um, there was a kind of a military connection to the family in that Hannah's grandfather had been uh, quite a renowned uh, military man. And when Hannah was small, uh, she tended to be something of a tomboy. We'd say a tomboy these days. And she liked to play games with the boys, marching, soldiers marching up and down, that kind of thing. As those eight children grew up, they um, all ended up with a connection with the army and the military. The boys tended to go into the army and the girls tended to marry soldiers and Hannah was no exception. And when she was in her late teens, um, she met someone called James Sums and he was a soldier and they married. Now, unfortunately, James wasn't the best of husbands in case he could be uh, quite an abusive kind of a man. Anyway, Hannah got pregnant, and while she was pregnant, James deserted her. Um, Hannah seemed to like to think that it was uh, because he'd been forced to go back into the army, but in fact that wasn't the case, I don't think. Anyway, Hannah had the baby, but unfortunately the baby died soon after birth. So that left poor Hannah without a husband and also without the baby. 
But being the feisty woman she was, she decided that she was going to go and look for this errant husband. Now, I can't quite understand why she'd want to do that, because he didn't sound to me to be very nice, but there you go. Now, she knew that she'd have to look for him in the army, but um, unfortunately, they weren't taking women recruits at that time. So she decided that she would pose as a man. She borrowed a suit of clothes from her brother-in-law and she dressed as a man and she made her way to Coventry where they were actually recruiting into the army. Um, by this time we were at 1745, uh, the time of the Jacobite Rebellion, when Bonnie Prince Charlie was making a bid for the, um, the British throne. So the uh, British uh, were amassing an army to take Bonnie Prince Charlie on. So when Hannah got to Coventry, she was taken on, sorry, traffic. She was taken as, enlisted as a soldier. Nobody realized she was a woman and she called herself uh, James Gray. And she enlisted in the 6th Regiment of Foot, which is now part of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. The regiment started to move north, marching up towards Carlisle to meet up with Bonnie Prince Charlie, which ultimately happened right up in Culloden. But on the way, an unfortunate thing happened. Um, the a wife of one of the sergeants took a bit of a shine to Hannah, and the sergeant was not best pleased. Um, obviously, the sergeant's wife thought she was a rather nice young man, didn't realise that she was a woman. The sergeant brought some sort of trumped up charge against Hannah and as a result of that she was sentenced to 500 lashes. It was a charge of insolence or something of that sort. Now Hannah realised that if that was carried out then she would be exposed in every sense of the word and so she went AWOL and she made away from the north of England down to Portsmouth and there she enlisted in the Marines and again as a man calling herself James Gray and nobody realised that she was a woman. She got into a ship and went off to India and while she was in India she actually uh, was involved in battles and she was injured, um, sometimes quite superficially but other time on one occasion certainly rather more seriously when an Indian woman nursed her back to health. Not revealing that she, Hannah was a woman, although obviously the Indian woman could see that she was. So Hannah was there in the end for about four and a half years and the ship then started to make its way back to um, England and when she got to Europe she discovered that her husband had been hanged for murder in uh, Genoa in Spain. Hmm. See I thought he was no good, I didn't think she should go looking for him. Anyway. The quest was over, so once her ship docked at Gravesend, she uh, left um, the Marines, she resigned, and she went to live with her sister in Wapping. Um, and she resumed her life as a woman, obviously, and she started to tell people um, what had happened to her and various accounts of her adventures while she'd been in the military. And she became quite a well-known kind of person. Um, she was awarded annuity by the Duke of Cumberland because she'd suffered from wounds and she bought a pub in Wapping which apparently she named the female warrior. Um, she started to uh, be asked to uh, account, give more accounts of her life in the Marines and in the end she was going into theatres telling people about what had happened to her, um, dressed as a man and she'd march up and down and do various drilling exercises and so on. And um, she became a Chelsea pensioner so she was a real celebrity of her time. Um, she married again, in fact she married twice and she had two sons who certainly um, survived into adulthood. Um, sadly, as she got older, uh, she developed what I think was probably dementia, but uh, in those days they didn't quite understand what it was and you were considered to be mad if you started to get demented in, as you got older. And she actually ended up her life in Bedlam, which was really quite sad. Um, 
However, the story didn't end there because she is actually buried in the Chelsea Hospital and during her lifetime various portraits were painted of her and one of her portraits hangs in the Chelsea Hospital with a copy here at the Guildhall in Worcester. So that's something about the life of Anna Snell, who lived at 25 Friar Street. Thank you very much and I'm now going to pass you over to Linda. Hello, my name's Linda and I'm another of the Green Badge Guides from Worcester Walks. And I'm here today as part of the Blue Plaque Tour and I know you've seen others. So we're here today to see this blue plaque. Ah, well, this blue plaque actually. This is Sarah Siddons' plaque. Now, Sarah Siddons was known as the uh, greatest dramatic actress. Sarah was the daughter of uh, the Kembles. The Kembles being a team, a group of strolling players. And at those times, there was not many theatres. So they performed in barns. And the barns that they performed in here was at, on the site of this building behind me. Right next door to the Golden Lion, it was the King's Head and they had a barn at the rear. As strolling players, they put on their performances and Sarah uh, was the daughter of Roger and Sarah Kemble. And Sarah made her first appearance here at the age of 12, playing Princess Elizabeth, uh, which was a play about King Charles I. And she went down really well. She was a very good little actress. As time went on, um, her fame grew and it even attracted the attention of David Garrick, uh, the actor manager from Drury Lane in London. <laughs> so the performances uh, would take place here in the yard of the King's Head. Strolling players were an important part of life, it was the entertainment uh, of the city and this was how people made their living and enjoyed having theatrical productions. Sarah uh, was born in 1755 and became part of the Kemble family group. The Kembles were known to be in Worcester from about 1685. The family can be traced back to about 1685. The barn, the theatre barn behind us, was known to be here from 1717, so quite a long time. Because she attracted the attention of David Garrick, uh, I don't think he ever really forgot about that. But at the age of 17, Sarah got married um, and had seven children, but only two survived. When Sarah was a child, she and her brother went to school at Thornlow House. Thornlow House is better known to most local people as the Worcester Eye Hospital. As time went on, she was persuaded to go back, go to London to perform. So she went and it was an utter disaster. She had stage fright, she couldn't perform, and so she came back to Worcester. But in 1782, she went back and she made her debut on the stage in Drury Lane. And this time, she was an unmitigated success. She was fabulous. Everybody loved her. They couldn't wait to get in the theatre to seize her, see her. And the excitement when she was on stage performing was such that sometimes people in the audience fainted uh, because of the sheer excitement of it all. And the critics were always saying things like, uh, you haven't lived till you've seen Sarah, Bur Sarah Kemble. But of course, by now, at 17, she married and she had become Sarah Siddons. Hence the plaque for Sarah Siddons. So she went to London, became this fantastic success, tragic actress, playing parts such as Lady Macbeth and Desdemona. And she went from earning three pounds a week to earning four to five thousand pounds, which was a huge sum in those days. And she performed for King George III at Buckingham House and at uh, Windsor Castle. And she attracted the attention of the artists of the time and her portrait was painted by Reynolds and Gainsborough. When she died in 1832, I'm so sorry, 1831, she was so fated 
that over 5,000 people attended her funeral and she was interred in Paddington Green Cemetery. I'm only part of Worcester Walks and we would very much like you to come and visit us at www.worcesterwalks.co.uk and I'm very pleased to say to you that this plaque has been made possible but only with the help of Worcester Civic Society and that's why you'll see Civic Society and Worcester Walks on this plaque which should go up in August. And of course, we hope you enjoy many more of the other items that the Worcester Festival are offering to you over the internet during the Worcester Festival week. So thank you very much and I hope to see you on a walk or maybe even a talk very soon.